Alrighty. Thanks everyone for braving the cold. Negative 15 degrees Celsius today. It's been uh, kind of crazy. Uh, Alright, so before we begin, are there any questions on the homework? Great, so everyone's going to get a perfect score on it, right? Okay. All right, so today we're going to cover a fairly important topic in databases, uh, storage. If you've taken an, uh, a class on operating systems in undergrad, a lot of this is probably going to be very familiar, hopefully. Uh, but I'm going to try and toss in a few new things as well. But before I get to that, let's do a very brief review of what we went over last week. And I'm going to start that off with a review of relational algebra. So, so as we went over last week, uh, any sort of database query over relational model uh, can be phrased in terms of uh, basically these uh, relational operators. Uh, selection, which given a set of tuples, will pick a subset of those tuples. Projection, which is going to get rid of uh, columns that you don't need. Uh, the cross product operation, which is going to take two sets and provide you with all pairs of tuples in either set. Set difference is going to remove tuples from one set that are present in a second set. Union is going to take tuples that appear in either set. And then we have a couple of other operations, including the join operation, uh, which can be computed in terms of these other operations, uh, but which are nevertheless uh, sometimes quite helpful. Now, of course, as with any review, I want you to participate. So, here we have a little uh, query. Uh, in addition to the captain and location table that we had last week, I'm going to introduce this affiliation table here. And what I'd like you to do uh, right now is turn to your neighbors and find me the last names of all captains uh, on a ship located somewhere in the Federation. Turn to your neighbors, introduce yourself, say hi, be social. tables, um, location, uh, captain, and affiliation. Uh, where the locate, it's location of every uh, ship. And captain, Yes, uh, sorry, uh, yes, captain and ship. Thank you. I will update the slides. All right, so this is hopefully fairly straightforward. Uh, how do you compute this? Where's that chuck? Straightforward. How do we do it? Uh, 
All right, let's let's do this one instruction at a time. What's the first? Uh, what's the first thing you might want to do? Join between location and and affiliation. Okay, so location and affiliation. I'm going to abbreviate that just uh, with the first letters. Okay, location affiliation. Anything else? Or what What else? Again, join with? Captain. captain. Okay. Join with captain and? Selection on last, uh, sorry? Selection on uh, affiliation, okay. Anything else? And a projection. Okay, uh, down to last name. Okay, uh, is that necessarily the most efficient thing you can do? No. What can you do better? Select sooner. Okay, so you can do something like that, right? Where you select, you first project out the rows. Uh, why is this faster? Be yes, because the number of join, uh, the number of rows in the remaining two joins uh, ends up being smaller. But as it turns out, we can actually do this even more efficiently. Any ideas? Reduce the number of columns. Exactly. So you could potentially put in even more projections in there, get rid of even more columns, and that would make things even faster. Okay, enough review. On to storage. So, storage pretty much revolves, uh, a database's view of storage pretty much revolves around one thing, the memory hierarchy, and how we can make the best use of it. Uh, those of you who have taken operating systems or computer architecture uh, have, are probably familiar with a di this diagram or, or something very much like it, uh, where at the very top you have uh, memory that is extremely, extremely fast, but typically very small. Uh, the uh, x86 architecture, for example, has only eight registers, um, hand wavy, but only eight registers, which are extremely fast, uh, but they can only store eight uh, full words. On the other hand, you have things like uh, hard drives or tape drives that can store multiple terabytes of, of storage, uh, but are typically much uh, slower. So. Uh, basically, the things we're going to be dealing with, for the most part in this class, uh, we're going to be dealing with everything from RAM, uh, flash memory, hard disks, tape drives, uh, not necessarily tape drives, but just to give you a general picture of, uh, of, of sort of the kind of things that databases tend to have to deal with, uh, it's basically this spectrum. Um, now, each of these storage media has certain properties. Uh, can anyone name a couple of properties of uh, maybe any of these these uh, storage media that we have uh, up on? Yes. RAM is volatile. Okay. So what does that mean? That yeah. So it's not going to the data that you store in RAM isn't going to get persisted. So if you uh, restart the computer, or if there's a power failure or something, then uh, RAM, RAM can't be used, used to persist data. OK, what else? Cost. Sorry? The cost. The cost. OK, so things towards uh, the higher cost more. Uh, things towards higher up cost more. Yeah. So typically, RAM is going to cost you a lot more per megabyte than tape drives. Anything else? Random access. Random access. Great. Uh, what about random access? So can you do random access on a tape drive? No. Hypothetically you can, but it's going to be very, very costly. Uh, what about hard disk? Yes, we can. Yes? Exactly. Flash memory? Can you do random reads on a flash drive? Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Where does a database live? Trick question, all of these. Databases live everywhere, which is why you should study them. OK, so uh, basically the question, we're going to try and answer uh, four questions over the course of this lecture. And 
even uh, over the next few lectures. Uh, so first off, how are we going to uh, take advantage of the various properties of this memory hierarchy and optimize uh, basically our use of the various layers of memory? Um, now this is going to tie in very closely to how the data gets accessed, what kind of access patterns we're using. And so we're going to need to uh, tailor those access patterns uh, for the storage medium that we're using. Uh, there's also a question of data organization. So once the data is actually stored on disk, how do we organize it both to minimize access costs and minima minimize the amount of space we're using, as well as anything else that we need to optimize. But these, these are the two primary constraints. Uh, in a typical database system, uh, these questions are answered by two separate components of the system. Uh, if you'll recall a couple of slides ago, I had this uh, layered architecture of a database. And two of those layers were the buffer manager and the file manager. And the buffer manager is going to help us deal with uh, sort of traversing the multiple layers of the, uh, the memory hierarchy. And the file manager is going to help us uh, organize the data. Okay, let me address that last question first. So how exactly are we going to organize data? Well, in a typical database, uh, there are sort of four, three or four different uh, approaches uh, to storing data. Uh, you can store data in just any order whatsoever, uh, just, just throw it into, uh, into the file, uh, and this is appropriately called a heap. Uh, you could also have some sort of grouping on the data, um, either uh, by sorting the data over some field or by maybe putting data items that are frequently accessed together. And in addition to these two uh, general storage uh, approaches, uh, there's also a third, uh, I guess, concept uh, that can be applied on top of either of them, which is to build additional data structures and store those and use those additional data structures to help us navigate uh, the contents of the file, and this is typically called an index. So, uh, just off the top of your heads, is there any, uh, what are, I guess, the, the benefits to each of these? So, what is, what is a benefit of uh, using a heap file, uh, uh, using a heap to store your data? It's fast in what sense? Insertions. So, you can write to heap files very quickly. Uh, can you read from them quickly? No. no. Well, that depends, actually. Uh, can, uh, if there are individual elements that you're looking for, I agree completely. A heap file is uh, not necessarily all that cheap to read from. Uh, what if you're trying to access all of the data in the file? It's basically not going to be more expensive or less expensive than any other storage mechanism in general. Uh, all right, what about, let's, let's say, sorting the file. What kind of benefit do we get uh, if the file is sorted on a particular key? On a particular column, sorry. It will be costly to insert data. It will be costly to insert data, but easier to access it. Uh, what about if you're looking for data on a different key? Uh, a key other than the one that we sorted on? Same as a heap, yeah. All right. Uh, what about index? When would we use an index in, in general? Or uh, could you repeat that? Okay. Uh, essentially, yes. So it's going to give you faster access uh, to either of these types, either of these layouts. Uh, but it also costs, uh, there's, there's a cost associated with maintaining the index. Uh, and that's both in terms of memory used and in terms of actual computation cost. Uh, let's say we are interested in doing lookups on a single key. Uh, what kind of, what storage mechanism should we use? Sorted. Okay, what about if, we're look, if we have two separate keys? Uh, and we're interested in doing lookups on, uh, on one of them or both of them? Index. And index is built on top of something else. We use a heap file or sort of. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Now, uh, does it matter? 
when we're, we're trying to figure out which sort of uh, storage mechanism we're using, does it matter what sort of underlying physical device we're actually storing these, th these data files on? Yes, okay. Could you give me an example? Well, let's say we're using a tape drive. What would you use? I'm sort of using tape drive as an extreme here, uh, although they're actually used. Hmm? A heap, sorry? Clustered. Maybe, it depends on, uh, in general you'd probably want to use a heap file because insertions are going to be extremely expensive. Uh, although it depends on how, actually yeah, it depends on how frequently you change the data. Um, Okay, and we actually answered this other question already. So, okay, so that sort of gives you a high level of organization. We'll get back to that in a bit. Um, now, in terms of I.O., in terms of the, the memory hierarchy, uh, any sort of computations that we do are generally, generally, generally going to be performed on data that's sitting in RAM, um, which means First, we need to get the data into RAM from whatever layer is underneath. Uh, and, of course, the, the big problem here that we're trying to address is that this both reading data out of these, these uh, underlying layers and writing data back to these underlying layers is expensive. Um, so that possibly leads us to a question of, uh, okay, uh, RAM is, uh, wh why not just go with RAM entirely? Uh, well. As we've already uh, discussed, RAM is typically more expensive than hard disks and typically much smaller. Um, you might get a machine with as much as a couple, like a terabyte of RAM, but that's going to be hideously expensive. A typical desktop machine, uh, more like 128, uh, caps out at more like 128 or so. Rough estimates. And of course, uh, RAM is, uh, is volatile, so you're going to lose, lose all of your data every time you restart the machine. Now that said, um, is, this a, uh, is this enough to convince you that RAM is, uh, is insufficient for any sort of database purpose? Uh, is it feasible to build a, a database system that resides entirely in memory? Yeah, so actually the, uh, your de uh, the definition of tiny in this case is actually kind of surprising. Um, so I agree, if, if it's much smaller than what, uh, what would end up getting stored uh, on a hard disk, uh, yeah, you definitely want to use, use RAM if you can, because it's fast. Um, but what, what does that mean? Um, so typically, I mean, here, 128 gigabytes is actually probably more than enough information to store, uh, more than enough space to store uh, a major corporation's, uh, basically all of the, the, the stuff that would typically be stored uh, in a fully fledged database system of a, a major corporation maybe five or ten years ago. And in fact, it's still entirely possible to, to store all of uh, major corporations' financials and, uh, and transaction information in an in-memory database, and in fact, a lot of them do. Uh, okay, so that gives us the ability to, um, that gives us uh, potentially some space for these, these in-memory databases. Uh, what kind of things could go wrong? Uh, well, RAM is volatile, so we're going to, if, uh, <clears throat> if there's a crash or something, we're going to lose information. Uh, how do we, how can we deal with that? And again, just, yeah. What is in memory uh, A database that is located entirely in RAM. So there's, there's actually a fair bit of, of um, both production systems and research systems that live entirely in, uh, in RAM. And of course, each of these systems has to deal with a whole range of issues. And the biggest one of them is, how do you deal with data loss? RAM is volatile. How do you deal with the fact that uh, one of your machines crashes? Any thoughts? Replication. Replication. 
Okay, so if you have the same data across multiple devices, you can be resistant to individual machines failing. What about if an entire data center fails? Backup? Yeah, so you can have uh, what kinds of backups? Replicated, well, if it's replicated on the same, uh, the same, at the same data center, then if the data center goes down, then uh, you lose all of your data. What if you're, uh, how would you stay resilient to that? Remote, okay, so you could replicate your data to a different data center, great. Uh, or, yeah, so that's actually one of the, the techniques that people use. And uh, one other way is that you don't necessarily have to have your data, uh, if you can just write it to some place, you can do that pretty efficiently. Uh, write it to some persistent storage uh, in a way that isn't necessarily going to be all that fast to access, uh, but you can, you can still persist the data while allowing users uh, to access it pretty efficiently. Um, what about scaling? So how do you deal with the fact that uh, not all databases are going to necessarily fit in 128 megabytes of space? Yeah, so partition the database across multiple nodes. And we'll get into that uh, quite a bit later in the term. Okay, so in-memory databases are great. As a researcher, I love them. They make things so much simpler. Uh, but what we're going to address today is this question of, okay, how do we deal with the fact, uh, how do we deal with situations where we do actually need to go to hard disks? So, uh, what is a hard disk or any sort of uh, persistent disk in, uh, that's commonly used today look like? So in general, uh, data access on a disk is going to be done in terms of uh, pages, what are called pages, that typically are about four kilobytes in size. Now the data that gets stored in here is typically going to be a lot less than four kilobytes of space. So um, why is it necessarily a bad idea, or why is it going to be expensive uh, potentially to store multiple tuples per, per page? Yes? Could you speak up? Sorry. Yeah, so, and what about if you need to read a single value? Well, uh, even, if you, even if you have an index, even if you know exactly where in the file the data is located, you still need to uh, do exactly the same thing. You, you still need to access the entire page. Uh, so what are some ways of possibly mitigating the costs? Uh, hmm? Well, that'll actually make things typically a bit more expensive because now you're forced to read an entire page every single every single time you want to tell it. Uh, what if yes? Smaller. Oh, well, okay. This is actually a limitation of the disks themselves. Um, okay. Let's say we want to read lots of tuples, uh, but we're only interested in certain tuples. Uh, let's say yes. Exactly. So if you're looking for certain types of tuples, uh, if you know that your users are going to be frequently looking for certain types of tuples, then you probably want to keep those tuples together on the same set of pages. Okay. Uh, so what does a disk typically look like? Um, well, a disk is generally composed of a spindle with a set of platters on it. Uh, and this is mostly here to just make sure we're all using the same terminology. Uh, the platters are going to spin, typically uh, 5400, 7200 uh, RPM are uh, common numbers. Uh, there is an arm assembly that moves across uh, the disk, the platters, uh, writing to various tracks. Uh, if any of you are familiar with record players, uh, this is... Did I just date myself? Okay. Uh, this is, well... Alternatively, this is what record players were like. Um, and because, so we have typically one uh, disk head per platter, and the arm is going to control all of the disk heads at the same time. So 
it makes sense to sort of talk about the, the tracks that are in the same place on each platter, uh, and we're going to call those cylinders. And of course, every operation is going to read or write a single block at a time. Um, again, terminology, uh, there are, when, whenever you need to access a block, there are three components to, that, uh, to the cost of accessing that block. Uh, there's the amount of time that it takes uh, for the disk head to be moved into the right place. This is known as the seek time. Uh, there is the rotational delay, which is basically how much time it takes for the, disk, uh, the platter to spin into the right place so that the disk head is over the track that you're reading. Uh, and there's the transfer time, which is the uh, amount of time that it takes to actually do the read. Um, so off the top of your heads, do you see anything obviously uh, out of whack here, or anything that is dramatically, uh, that is a dramatically large component of, of this uh, cost? Seek, Seek time and rotation. and rotation, yes. So ideally, uh, in order to make these uh, reads and writes more efficient, we want to make sure that the seek and rotational delay times uh, are as low as possible. So we want to keep all of the blocks together, um, either within the same track, within the same cylinder, or if necessary, in adjacent cylinders. And this allows us to uh, minimize the seek and rotational delay. Okay, so that's hard disks. How to flat, yes? How is the mapping between a block and a Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, block and page are, for our purposes, uh, equivalent terms. Okay, so how does that differ from uh, sort of the, the memory that you, uh, from flash memory? Um, well, flash memory comes, just to give you sort of a high level idea, uh, comes in two different types, NOR and NAND. Uh, each of them have certain varying properties, but basically NAND is, is probably uh, a bit better, uh, the better of the two, uh, provides uh, higher uh, storage sizes for lower space, and uh, also allows you to operate on individual bits. Um, now, the, sort of the, the, the gotcha about Flash is that although you can write to individual bits, you can overwrite individual bits, uh, it's necessary to um, erase entire blocks at once. So you can... Uh, in order to set uh, blocks to, to the zero state... Uh, sorry, you can only set entire blocks to the zero state uh, while you can... No, I'm getting that wrong. Uh, you, can, you can set all of the bits in a block, or you have to set all of the uh, bits in a block at once, but then in order to unset the bits, uh, you can do that pretty much uh, on individual bits. Um, one other sort of gotcha about flash memory is that uh, they typically have much lower lifespans than hard disks. In, in particular, uh, every time you erase uh, a flash, a block of, of flash memory, uh, you are basically going to uh, damage it slightly to the point where uh, after about a thousand, uh, uh, Sorry, a hundred thousand to a million erasures, uh, the entire that entire block goes bad. So, um, because of this, flash tends to have a quite different uh, cost structure to to disks uh, to hard disks. Um, it's and we were getting at this earlier, uh, reads you can do random reads very efficiently. You can just pick a random bit read its value very quickly. Uh, if you want to uh, append to a particular block, you can also do that very quickly. On the other hand, if you need to write to a block, you might need to erase the entire block first, and that tends to be uh, noticeably more expensive. So just, uh, again, uh, from an intuitive perspective, uh, what, what kind of data structure uh, would you think is, is appropriate for this kind of, uh, yes? A linked list, or more generally? So uh, what, what feature of a linked list makes, uh, makes this particular uh, data structure efficient? Random reads. Random reads, and you're always, uh, when you create new <coughs> values, where do they go? 
anywhere, exactly. So you're, you're sort of always appending. Um, so linked lists are a great example. Uh, logs are actually another, um, another sort of data structure that works very well in this because you always append. Okay, uh, so just to summarize what we've gotten to so far, um, hard disks <coughs> tend to have much slower write times and much slower read times than flash. Even just if the diskette is in the right place, uh, flash tends to be faster. And also flash supports random read access. On the other hand, hard disks tend to be much more durable and in general uh, tend to be bigger. Um, and of course, erasing flash tends to be a bit slower, which makes it uh, less efficient sometimes uh, than hard disks if you're doing a lot of writes. Which of these is, is better? Hard disk? I'm, I'm hearing a bit of both. Short answer, trick question. Neither. Uh, depends on what you're doing. Um, in some cases, flash is going to be better. In some cases, hard disks. And oftentimes, what you'll see is a combination of both. So you're going to have uh, the flash drive essentially occupies a slot above the hard disk in the memory hierarchy. You have the, the hard disk and then uh, some chunk of the, the state on the hard disk is going to get cached in the flash. Okay. Uh, well, we've been going through this stuff pretty fast. Okay. So we've established now that uh, disks are slow. Um, I haven't really addressed this too much, but there's obviously a chance that the disks will fail, uh, flash more than regular hard disks. So how can we make the disks faster, and how can, can we make them uh, more resilient to failure? Thoughts? Caching and backing. Say, uh, say again? Caching and backing up. Caching and backing up. Um, essentially, yes. Uh, and as it turns out, there's been a, uh, there is sort of a standard out there uh, that sort of automatically does a lot of this for you. Um, most of you are probably familiar with this idea of RAID. And essentially the idea of RAID, uh, or redundant arrays of in inexpensive or independent disks, depending on who you ask, uh, is to take lots of disks and group them together into a single sort of virtual disk. So you treat this one disk as if it were, uh, sorry, you treat these many disks as if they were a single disk, and uh, the, the RAID infrastructure uh, essentially automatically does, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it caching, but it automatically does uh, the backing up portion of, uh, of this. And by doing this intelligently, it allows us to not only increase the redundancy of, uh, of these disks, but it also allows us to increase the performance. And in general, this is done in, in two, uh, two high-level ways. Uh, striping, which allows us to take uh, all of the data that we're using and split it across the various disks that, that are in our array of independent disks. And among other things, that allows us to access data that resides on each disk in parallel, which, if we have two disks, would essentially double our data rate. And the other thing is mirroring, which allows us to keep, uh, which is basically using one disk as a, sort of a backup of the other disk. Yes? Uh, when can you say uh, redundant array of inexpensive disks? Um, it uh, depends on who you ask. The, the acronym doesn't have a firm definition. Independent, I think, is the official one. But again, uh, it's, I think it was originally inexpensive. But at that point, the disks cost a couple of thousand dollars a piece. So uh, inexpensive wasn't necessarily the best term for it. OK, uh, RAID, uh, there, RAID is generally classified in terms of levels. So there are different ways of applying, uh, different ways of combining these disks. And these, these ways are referred to in terms of levels. Uh, so level zero uh, basically is uh, you're going to stripe all of your data. So you have your data set here, and uh, with level zero, that data is going to be just split across the various drives in your RAID array. Um, no duplication whatsoever, no backups, uh, and this is going to, among other things, give us basically twice the disk bandwidth. Because if we want to read a red bit, we go to this disk. If we want to read a green bit, 
uh, we go to that disk, and both of those operations can be done in parallel. Uh, RAID level 1 operates on exactly two disks, and the idea is that all of your data gets mirrored across all of those disks. Um, among other things, this means that any data... Oh, so an entire copy of all of your data gets stored on both disks. Uh, among other things, this means that you're going to get twice the disk bandwidth for reads, uh, because either of these disks uh, can satisfy any request, but it'll, it also means uh, that each write has to go to all of your disks, so you don't get any additional performance benefit for writes. Uh, you can actually combine these two ideas, uh, what they call RAID zero, level 0 plus 1, uh, which allows you to uh, mirror sort of individual fragments of the disk, uh, get, take, take pairs of disks, use them to mirror, and then stripe over each of those disk pairs. Now, of course, this is a little bit uh, annoying because you have essentially half of your disks going to uh, backing up your data. Uh, is there any way of... So now what we'd like to do is use less than half of our disks as, as backups. And so there are uh, raids level 2 through 4 which do what's called striping, um, which, which do this, this striping idea, but rather than doing it across the entire disk, uh, they stripe individual uh, bits, bytes, or blocks. Uh, so in this case, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, the distinction for level two to four is that rather than um, mirroring, you use what are called parity bits, and I'll get to, I'll define those uh, in a moment. But the, the basic idea is that if you have um, n of these, these codes, these, these special uh, values, then you can uh, recover from a failure of exactly n drives. So here we're going to uh, do the striping across four of our disks, but then we're going to use three extra disks in order to uh, store these additional codes that allow us to recover from errors. Uh, and, of course, you can lose any of the three drives in this particular setup and still be able to reconstruct all of your data. Uh, so this is, uh, if you're in more interested in this, it's something called uh, error correcting codes. Uh, there's a huge array of these. Um, Dr. Rudra is the person to talk to if you're really interested in it. But the basic idea is that you can store n data values in, in sort of n plus k slots, and then if k of your, uh, your slots happen to get destroyed, then you can still reconstruct the original n data values from any of those uh, n slots. Um, now, let's go back to that picture. Um, why exactly... Can anyone give me some, some insight as to why this is potentially suboptimal? So how many disks are we using for reads? Every time we need to read uh, something, how many disks can we use? Four? Yeah. And how many disks do we have? Seven. So we're essentially losing uh, nearly, uh, nearly half of our disk bandwidth. Um, which brings me to RAID level 5, which is very much like RAID level 4, uh, but the data values are striped across all of the disks, and we sort of put these additional parity bits, um, we, we spread them out across all of the disks. And this gives us a considerably more read bandwidth. Uh, so, I'm actually going to get out a little bit early today. Uh, to summarize, disks provide us with uh, essentially a way of storing data uh, in a way that persists past a crash or power failure. Uh, they support random access, and uh, but all at the same time, we still want to sort of tailor our access patterns uh, to the disks themselves. Uh, and the the sort of key idea that we're going to bring up next week is that. The database knows essentially how it's going to be accessing the data, and that's going to allow us uh, to tailor the access patterns that we use uh, for uh, the media, the storage media uh, that we're going to be using. So, with that, uh, any questions?
All right, uh, reminder, homework is due on Friday, um, 12, uh, sorry, 11.59 p.m. on Friday, uh, and no extensions are, are granted without medical uh, excuses. So with that, thanks a lot, and see you on Friday.